started here today. So um, today we have a little bit of a different one for Space at DC seminar. We're actually having a uh, collaborator uh, who's been working with our up team um, with us today. And um, the, the Jamesh at Old Dominion uh, University is a uh, PhD student. And uh, as you can read here, I'll, I'll read it off because yeah, the, uh, the, I guess the short of it, it will say is that uh, it's about uh, the oil boom, deposit booms, uh, how it relates to Virginia Tech, uh, um, a little bit more into that of the upper sat team. Um, and hopefully I get this right, Vincent, is um, uh, ODU and the work that's being done here and that someone presented here um, was the uh, providers for the boom that we're using uh, for UPROSAT, uh, which is a mission to, uh, it's a CubeSat, where they are going to um, deploy a boom and be able to take a picture of it uh, and see that it's deployed and, and the whole deployer mechanism is, uh, is something that we've been working on here at Virginia Tech. Um, and o uh, ODU is the kind of the supplier of that composite boom um, kind of thing, or at least we've been uh, maybe working uh, in close uh, and figuring out how the composite booms behave in certain environments. So, um, yeah, the, the longer title here uh, of Kamesh today is Development Experimental Law uh, Validation in Progressive Failure Modeling of an Ultra Thin High Stiffness Deployable Composite Boom for In Space Applications. So, um, without, uh, with that introduction, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Yep. So thank you, thank you, Kevin, for introducing me. So I'm a, I'm a second year PhD student uh, at Old Dominion uh, University and um, Mechanical and Aerospace Department. And the project which uh, I'm presenting is done in collaboration with two labs at ODU, which is Space System Laboratory and the Composite Modeling and Manufacturing Lab. So the topic which I'm presenting is kind of a broad topic. Um, starting from the designing phase, developing the model for it, making in-house uh, fabrication procedure for it, and as well as the validating for uh, the real-life space mission, what we uh, have at the ODU. So let's get started. So let me just, I, I think uh, uh, I've seen a couple of previous uh, speakers have already talked about the uh, composite boom on this platform. So just a quick introduction about what, what kind of uh, composite we are talking about. So space industry has been already using all the uh, composites, specifically rigid composite. They can be used for a kind of a stiffening uh, purpose or shear panels for the structures satellite structures and here is one example where a traditional composite structure has been used uh, for a parabolic antenna. And uh, if you see, it has the vertical stiffener agents as well as the parabolic disc. So these composites are low strain composites. So they barely can take 0.1% person strain. Uh, and they when we go for the higher strain deformation for the structure, they, they kind of fail. We, because they are not designed for that. Uh, whereas the composite which we are involved in is um, high strain composite. That basically means they can be wrapped in a smaller radius. And they once they are deployed, they can provide stiffness in certain direction. So now by using the composite, we can we have the advantage of optimizing the structure by selecting the different layups. I mean, layups means optimizing the fiber direction as well as by optimizing the shape of the structure, we can even um, provide a directional stiffness. So that's why we call it high strain ultra light deployable composite structure. This is a new kind of material. People have been working on it for a decade or two. And uh, here is our contribution in the domain. So the uh, motivation is basically uh, to develop a whole understanding, a broader understanding of the material, specifically thin uh, wall composites, because we see a lot of applications, specifically in space, um, where they are different architecture. So here, what we have is the uh, Caltech proposing different configuration where these thin wall composites are used. And uh, it can be used as a bending architecture or tensile architecture or cable-based architecture. And there's one real life application of what NASA has recently deployed a, so a flexible solar panel using this 
similar kind of components. One more example is the uh, antenna deployment by MMA. It's an interesting design where they have a four carbon fiber boom expanding the uh, surface area for the reflector. And uh, we have something, um, uh, yeah, there's a more, more example by Air Force Research Laboratory where they have a carbon fiber structure which is which can extend uh, some sensitive uh, sensors like a magnetometer because we have sometimes there's multiple application where they need to measure uh, magnetic readings but they cannot mount it on the carbon uh, uh, mount it on the payload or the satellite structure because of the magnetic noise of the other subsystems so so we need a structure we can extend this uh, sensitive uh, sensors away from the satellite so this these structures can even be used for such application and um, we have an interesting concept uh, and uh, as a concept model of uh, developing a um, uh, multi uh, multi purpose membrane which can help us the satellite to deorbit as well as to in situ uh, drag measurement so while the satellite is deorbiting it will in situ measure it rather than uh, some other alternative methods. So by this readings, we can develop a very accurate uh, drag temperature model, which is significant to for the uh, accuracy of um, predicting the the orbiting rates of other satellites as well. So talking about the uh, mission, what we have, um, so the development of the carbon fiber structure, what we did is specific to this mission. And we say this mission as a stepping stone to our long-term objective of developing something for in-space uh, uh, manufacturing as well as assembly. Uh, so this project is kind of supported and developed collaboratively with um, multiple organization. And we have uh, two um, different type of payloads. So one is the deployable composite structure. Another payload is provided by the US Coast Guard Academy. So I'll be talking about because I've been closely involved in development of the um, composite structure payload. So I'll be kindly briefing uh, about it and uh, we'll see what are the constraints which were provided by the payload and how we kind of derive the uh, design effects of a composite boom from this payload. So the payload has an interesting feature which we have named it as multi-stage deployable verification module, which will uh, not only verify the deployment, but even monitor the behavior of the carbon fiber structure during the lifetime of satellite. So, uh, so the lifetime of satellite can expand to almost six months to one year as of now. Uh, and we have a, uh, multiple sensors, for example, the encoders at the central hub, the strain gauges on the carbon fiber structure, which can measure the thermal shocks while uh, entering from the eclipse to the sun side and uh, have an encoder which can measure basically these um, deployment rates which will help us to monitor the structure and uh, so yeah so talking about the cross section the uh, selection of the cross section for specifically um, this kind of structure is significantly important and when you talk about a long-term understanding of the structure uh, we needed a structure which is more multifunctional as well as it's uh, stiff for uh, it's stiffer for uh, various mission and I feel CTM kind of um, met uh, most of the requirements because if you see other cross section they are called as kind of open cross section and CTM is the only cross section which gives a uh, uh, maximum uh, second moment of inertia in uh, mostly like bending on the x, y axis, y axis, as well as the toxinal direction. So CTM was the obvious choice. And see this, this I think this uh, configuration, this landing to cross section is kind of used by uh, various NASA mission as well as the SAM mission. So it's uh, a very good to go to demonstrate our design cycle of uh, uh, design cycle as well as our demonstration of um, the deployment of the boom. So we did a quick grid study of varying the parameters and see the response of how the second moment of inertia will change. So we uh, specifically took, there are probably six parameters uh, where this each geometry is uniquely defined, but uh, we stick to two parameters which has significant impact on the second moment of inertia. So 
one of the parameters was the radius and the curvature. And if you see, based on our sea land mission, we had the uh, the flattening uh, limitation because we have the payload of one U. And when you make the structure flat and wrap it on a cylinder, uh, the max there was a limit of or the spool height. So that is what is considered. So what you see is the red lines are the limits which are set and that kind of overlaps with the dimensions shown on the left bottom where you have the uh, curvature radius was, I think 12 mm, you have 12 mm, 12.5 mm and the uh, angle was 65.4. So based on that, we got a best a moment of inertia and if you compare with the the number it's significantly good for the scale at which we are talking because uh usually the nasa mission where they are planning a large solar sail or something they have a cross section area quite bigger so they obviously the uh the moment of inertia will be um significantly high and as you see it's the inverse square law where the it's exponentially increases based on the radius but uh, for the mission where we have a flatting radius of 62 mm and uh, your packaging volume is within one U, this moment of inertia is considered significantly good. And um, so, yeah, we started with the fabrication process. So we started small with 400 mm boom. Uh, we make a mold of uh, commercial grade aluminum. And uh, now we are at the stage where we are scaling up our process by 2x. It's, two, it, it's not limited to 2x, but uh, but uh, the, the manufacturing procedure, what we have, the equipment, what we have, it's limited to the size. So we're sticking with this number, but there is definitely a scope of scaling this up to a couple of meters. And um, so there was a, a couple of attempts for the development. Our first attempt was a single cure cycle without internal vacuum bagging procedure um second was the, so they're talking about the first procedure we just uh, thought it was straightforward manufacturing process where we take the curing cycle for a composite and then um, cure it in the autoclave but it didn't work out we'll discuss what are the defects and then yep yeah. so so yeah so the first issue which we faced because of a single cure without vacuum bag procedure is um, so where we kind of use two carbon fiber prepegs, um, the two layers, top and bottom layers, and we kind of lay down on the mold, which I showed in you in the previous slide, and we close the mold. So when you close the mold, we were assuming that the, because of the uh, wetting procedure, because when we increase the temperature, the, the, the resin inside the prepeg will help uh, to stick the layers to the mold, but when we kind of increases to the higher, higher curing temperature. Uh, it kind of didn't adhere to the top portion of the mold. And if you see, there is a kind of the slagging on from the, for the top layer. So which is not ideal because if the shape is changed, then the we are not actually meeting our requirement of the uh, best performance of the structure. Or maybe you can say we are not very close to the uh, second moment of inertia, which we anticipated. So we kind of added the internal support. So we kind of used the internal vacuum bag here. So if you see the pink color stuff, which is a kind of a sleeve, which is uh, placed uh, between the mold before closing it. So when we do a smart vacuum bagging approach and uh, this internal sleeve will basically give us support to the top ply. And that really helped, that gave us a perfect uh, shape what we wanted, but that uh, kind of uh, we faced a different challenge where when we close the mold and when we reach to the higher curing temp um, the the highest temperature during the curing procedure, uh, there was a resin squeeze out. So the red spot what you see is the resin squeezed out because of the closing mold. So the mold was will be already closed, but it will be under constant uh, pressure. So when the temperature rises it will kind of squeeze out the extra resin and there'll be accumulation of the resin near the um, kind of the junction between the top and the bottom ply and that is presented in red. With this thing is not acceptable because what happens is this is kind of the uh, thickness irregularity. So there is a higher thickness in the 
uh, the junction side. So when you kind of wrap them, uh, wrap this carbon fiber structure on a, on a cylinder, um, this thicker region will be the source of crack, which will kind of damage the uh, carbon fiber and reduces the strength during the use, um, during the mission. So we kind of came up with the uh, co-curing procedure. So where you kind of increase the viscosity during uh, of the of the epoxy resin uh, until the gelation point where it is thick enough to stay inside the carbon fiber. And when we close the mold, there is very minimal or null squeezing out. And that gave us the perfect uh, uh, cross section, a very uniform thickness, and there was no use, uh, resin squeeze out. And um, that required us to kind of do a low temperature curing that increases the uh, viscosity, but doesn't cure completely. It just goes to the gelation point, and then we kind of re remove the mold and close it and do the complete curing. Hmm. So how do we test this structure? So, so first of all, the purpose of testing the structure is to validate what kind of failure the composite may go and even to calibrate a computational model. So I'll, I'll talk in the next slides, I'll talk about more about computational model, but just um, the slide is to get an understanding of what kind of testing we did to qualify our models. So, so it was simple four point bending testing. We tried with different span length for uh, L1, the top rollers. We did it with 20, 30, 40 mm, and uh, the load cell was used was a what 10 10 kilonewton load cell and which was good enough for this test and we added one more test in this where we do a so when we usually when we do a four point bending test we kind of apply the load and see the force versus displacement but now once we do the first cycle of loading we do another um, bending cycle which will basically um, ideally it should follow the same curve the same force uh, force displacement curve. If it is not following the same curve, that means that the first uh, bending cycle has initiated some damage, and due to which the stiffness and the strength of the um, material is hindered because of the previous damage. So we have this two cycle procedure where we kind of try to understand the failure behavior of the material. Yeah. So one one more testing which we kind of. Uh, I think which is a requirement also for uh, most of the space uh, structure, which are extended out of the structure, which is a uh, vibration testing. Um, this vibration testing is, uh, is different than this vibration testing, what we see for the structure level. The vibration testing is specifically to keep the cell, uh, to check out the uh, structure integrity during the launch vehicle, whereas this is, basically to understand the uh, kind of the structural rigidity um, and um, which varies based on mission to mission. But for the structure, what we have and for what application we have, the, um, the resonating frequency or the first mode should be between one to five hertz. So we did a scaled down version of the test. We, we are planning to launch a one meter long boom but uh, what we uh, took this, uh, when we did this test, we just did it for one feet, but we know the frequency and the mass behavior of the structure follows uh, inverse square law. So we can extrapolate with that. Um, but yeah, so we did we, the methodology which we selected to test the structure. Basically, uh, we used the design of experiments where we had three factors. Uh, which one is the deep load, assuming the structure can be even used as a um, payload to host at the at the uh, at the tip of the comp composite structure. So we had a tip load as one of the parameter. We had the boundary condition, and we had even um, intentionally created a defect in the composite. And I believe it's the next. Yeah, yeah. So if you see, there is a, intentionally we created a damage uh, by. Um, uh, wrapping it on a very smaller radius, which created very original crack, which was uh, there. And that was one of the parameter defect boom and not def uh, pristine boom. Uh, and the for the boundary condition, we had a fully blossom structure and a flat structure. Um, 
I don't have an image for that, but yeah. So we have two boundary condition for the root condi uh, root um, condition for the carbon fiber boom, mm -hmm. and the tip load. So tip load varied between uh, five point five to six point six six seven grams. And yeah, so talking about the modeling, so this is uh, um, this is significantly important for us to have the uh, better understanding of the what material we use because currently we are just using a lenticular cross section, but if we calibrate our model if, uh, with the material what we use, uh, it, we can even try it with the um, different cross section or different types of length or different type of um, configuration what we saw, right? So this is significantly important to have our understanding of the failure mechanics. So that's why the approach what we used is the progressive failure model. Uh, so we did these, Coupon testing first go, um, where we kind of made a tensile coupon um, for a different failure mechanics. If you see the here, you know, the failure is majorly because of fi fiber, and here you know, the failure is because of the shear, because the fiber orientations are different for both the samples. And if you see specifically for shear, the material behavior is highly nonlinear. And if you see the uh, nonlinearity is because of the shear behavior of the material. But if you see the dotted model is a computational model which captures really well with uh, the uh, material which we have selected. And just to highlight, we selected, um, it's unusual. So this is a good, I think, a discussion. So if you see, we tested with two plies as well as the one ply. So if you see the two ply has a better performance compared to one ply, but um, there is the same material, but when you really go from a thicker structure to a thinner structure, there's a change in property. So that's why the model, the material models, or maybe the uh, failure mechanics, what we see in the stiff structure cannot be applied for a thin structure. So this is a, I think this slide is a good example of why there is a significant um, uh, importance of computational models to understand the failure mechanics of a, of a thin wall composite. And these are the other parameters which are taken um, from other literature and uh, even derived from some of the homogenization models. Um, this is the basically our approach about how we did our progressive damage model. So it basically creates an homogenized uh, orthographic material and we assign uh, different damage parameters to it. So we know this is basically a kind of a stress versus strain relation where we have the modulus. And when when there is a damage, there is a degradation in the, in the modulus. So it kind of, uh, the D represents the damage behavior and the damage behavior captures the fiber failure as well as the metric failure. So we have to calibrate this model uh, using the coupon test we did in previous slide. So this is the results. So we saw so all the simulations were done in the backers. So what you see, we kind of see a trend um, in this uh, deformation. This is force uh, load versus deformation. And starting with the pre-flattening region. So pre-flattening region is mostly because of the preloading. So whenever you do a bending test that is significantly uh, it's it's important to do a preloading so that's why we have a pre-flattening and once we have overcome this pre-flattening region we get the real modulus or flattening modulus uh, where the um, the lenticular cross section is approaching the flat region and it reaches to the uh, the maximum load and it snaps and the snapping behavior and the post snapping behavior creates some amount of damage but it's really important to quantify this damage and see the implication of this damage. So this is the uh, uh, slide where we compare our simulation results with the experimental results. So talking about the um, our test, which we did about uh, different span length and uh, second, uh, second loading cycle, if you see the dotted lines are not exactly same, but uh, and as well as the snapping is a, uh, stability problem, so it, it cannot replicate the same result. There'll be some kind of inconsistency and snapping happens at the weakest point. Yeah. But if you see the modulus of it is significantly same, there is no much change in the models. 
this and uh, even if you see for the sample of 200 mm uh, span length it's 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 actually the um, not much change uh, and we are kind of satisfied with this result and we consider that uh, if we wrap it on a even a critical radius a bending critical radius of almost uh, 15 mm uh, radius um, cylinder still there will be no damage in the composite but we, we won't do that because we want to keep some safety margin. So our wrapping radius is somewhere um, 40 mm. Yeah, 40 mm dia. And uh, if you even uh, the model which we calibrate for our coupon testing is also nicely overlapping uh, with the results what we have observed in the experiment. So this is, uh, so, so if you have a computational model, we can do a lot of the stuff. We we obviously get the load versus deformation, but now we even see where exactly uh, the damage is and what type of damage is. So if you see, we uh, as I previously mentioned, we have the critical bending radius of approximately 14, um, 14 mm radius, and uh, if you see, there are different behavior, different nature of a failure. So the fiber failure is somewhat less compared to uh, somewhat more than the matrix failure, but now we even know the location of it. And um, as we have the two different plies, so uh, it was interesting to see that the top and the bottom ply is a different um, um, damage behavior. And that can um, help us to even figure out about uh, our laying configuration. So that's why I really love to work with this computational model that gives us more insight, which I think visually it's hard to get. Um, so yeah, this is the more quantification about the damage about, so we have our various parameters, as I previously mentioned, a different um, damage variables. Um, one of them is the fiber, fiber damage variable and the matrix damage variables. And this result basically show that one is basically meant that it's completely damaged and Point one is with respect to the fa maximum failure, what is the percentage of that uh, damage variable in that element? So if you see the most of the element failures are into 0.5 percent. So if you if you see this ratio, uh, 95 to 96 percent of the damage is under 0.5 damage parameter. And I think it's 99 for the matrix. So I think this is considered to be a good uh, model because visually also we never saw uh, a large amount of cracks while deformation and uh, we believe our damage model is properly calibrated so the results we, we get from this is uh, highly reliable. Talking about the test results from our design of experiments for structural um, application uh, uh, structural resonation exp uh, um, experimentation was um, so I think this is, this is the image which I was talking so this is one of the boundary condition where the um, the root condition was completely flat and completely blossom you see these numbers are too high but if you go with a longer boom of almost four times of this this will kind of reduce the inverse square law so this is the results from the uh, design of experiment and we found out the parameters which is steep load and the boundary condition had a uh, maximum impact on the uh, the resonating frequency and uh, we did a regression out of that and we found out it was obvious that um, uh, fully blossomed cross section had a higher uh, structural resonance um, but how much it's higher it will help us to kind of get a better understanding with uh, some of the decision making for the mechanism. So here is an overall understanding of where things fit. So we have the proper understanding of um, the, the mechanics, the material mechanics going under the carbon fiber structure. We have a proper understanding of um, what is the mission requirements that gives us a, a good confidence of making the uh, supporting uh, structure, supporting elements for these 
uh, deployment verification, and uh, that is, I think, that is, that is what was required for the sea line mission. We see this project to be uh, as a stepping stone, as I told you previously, that it can be even used for our uh, larger structure deployment because we have this higher, uh, highly calibrated uh, computational model which can be used to uh, demonstrate various loading condition, and we can see which kind of configuration will work best for what mission. Um, so thank you. Uh, I look forward to questions, suggestions, and comments. Uh, certainly, uh, those online, uh, thank you for uh, uh, giving, uh, just give your applause or whatnot as much as you can, but also uh, any questions here in the room. I mean, thanks for the presentation, by the way. Uh, so I had a quick doubt. Like, so when you were like uh, seeing like the deployment uh, of those groups, like so the critical direction that you figured out with the one is at the goal system. But like, what about if you had loads in like the perpendicular direction, like the line loads are like the edges which were like the two curvatures are like joined together. So is there some kind of a ratio in terms of like how much the bending forces are needed in the other perpendicular direction to like damage that group somehow? So I'm not sure if I got your question because there was a echo as well as the noise. Okay. I think that's because of the room, but uh, if, are you asking about the uh, the correlation between the tip load and the damage in the in the structure? Uh, not exactly. So I'm asking about like right now you're loading the structure in in a direction which has like a curvature of like on the curvature of the hoop. Yep. yep. What if you had loads from the perpendicular direction, like yes. on the line uh, line loads or something, like where the structure has like a line per se. Got it. I I got I got your point. So so if you see the uh. The different modes. Yeah, I think I didn't touch upon that. So thanks for the question. I, I think that's a very valid question. So if you see the uh, deformation mode, um, so so this is the weakest. Uh, so the first deformation mode is obviously torsional because the structure is not st uh, um, not stiff enough in the torsional direction. But the second weakest mode of deformation is this direction. The most stiffest is the direction which we are talking. So we already know the direction which has this flange to flange coming out is already stiff. So I, I think we as we we are the first important stuff is to do the uh, uh, torsional before even doing this. But we did this because specifically we were interested to see the ratio or the impact because of the uh, boundary condition or the root condition. Because if you have a um, um, Kind of do a torsional test is somewhat difficult um, to do with this kind of setup what we had. So we we first of all we took an understanding of uh, correlation with this second mode, and maybe yeah. But but we believe that uh, the if we're able to qualify it for this mode two and mode one, mode three is uh, hard to get, and that will it is already uh, the, the stiffest mode what we have. Thank you. Good, good question. Uh, other other questions online? Mm -hmm. I think someone online had a question, but I don't see him now in the meeting. There was a hand raised there. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I must have missed that. Uh, yeah, and uh, Vincent did correct me that. Uh, yeah, ODU is not the supplier that we've been getting the booms from NASA. Um, my, my apologies on that. I know, though, that you know, we're basically, uh, I think, relying on a lot of the expertise that you're, you're mentioning here. Um, that maybe yeah, I mean, so I was, yeah. You know, and maybe, that's, uh, that's right. Yeah. 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 Any, other, any, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, this is certainly uh, very interesting. I think uh, it's, a, it's really good to see 
it's something that you know we haven't seen as much. Um, so it's it's good to broaden our, our horizon and kind of our scope and see something. Thanks for coming out. Hello. There's someone there. They're trying to speak up. Uh. No, I'm not. Maybe, no, 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 maybe that was just echo then. <laughs> um, yeah, one one last chance for any questions. All right, I know with these virtual meetings, it's sometimes harder to find that mute button. But uh, thanks everybody for joining. Um, yeah. Thank you, Jamesh, for for this presentation. Um, I have been a little bit slow on getting the presentations up uh, online. Um, but mm -hmm. we'll be working on that um, actually today for the one that was two weeks ago. And uh, for those who are watching uh, uh, maybe in the next couple of days, I am looking for speakers uh, for the next presentation, their next seminar uh, coming up, I believe, in, in two weeks. So uh, let me know. Otherwise, uh, we'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>